begini 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 إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا إذ النفس أمارة بالسوء ومن سيئات أعمالنا اهدنا الصراط المستقيم من يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ومن يعص الله ورسوله فقد ضل ضلالا مبينا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله رب واحد وإله واحد له الأمر من قبل وله الأمر من بعد لا معقب لحكمه ولا مبدل لكلماته قوله الحق وهو خير الحاكمين وأشهد أن سيدنا وأولنا والشاهد علينا وهادينا محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبده ورسوله وصفيه وخليله أرسل على فترة من الرسل وقلة من العلم وضلالة في الناس من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا مضل له ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا هادي له اللهم اجعلنا من الذين يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه Amma Ba'd Dear committed brothers and dear committed sisters This month is the month of taqwa a word that has been that has suffered throughout the centuries and the ages it has suffered as today it is misunderstood by hither and yon by those we know and those we don't know ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kutiba alaykum as-siyam kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqun the reason we are fasting is that we are doing whatever we can do at this level to acquire this consciousness of Allah's power presence. 
When we are aware that Allah is powerful and forceful and almighty, then we acquire a certain behavior. It's not that Allah is absent. Allah is always here and now. Always. Many of us say Allah sees everything. Allah hears everything. Allah is everywhere. Many of us say that. But it is only a few of us who say, what is Allah going to do? There's a difference between confessing or acknowledging that Allah sees everything and hears everything, but is He going to do something? This is the gap that exists between where we should be and where we are. Our behavior today, our perception today is Allah is all-knowing, is all-seeing, is all-hearing, is all-merciful, is all this and is all that. None of us argue that. We submit to that fact. The leap that we have to take is, okay, once we settle on these facts, what is Allah doing or what is Allah going to do? If we acquire a sense of taqwa, we are required to see what Allah Jalla wa'ala is doing. Because if He is power present, if his power is always here, what is his power doing? Is his power inferior to the materialistic powers? Many of us, some of us drown in our rituals, some of us drowning in our rituals, are absent-minded. As concerns Allah's here and now power. This month of Ramadan wants us to regain and to recapture this vital sensory that belongs to us that Allah is always here. Even if we personally fail, Allah is always here. If I fail as a person, what does that mean? I'm a Muslim. I'm trying to do my best, but whatever I do and however much I am struggling, if the results are not to my expectations, that doesn't mean that I should be negligent of Allah's power presence. There's a saying that says Allah acts in mysterious ways. Our failure is that we do not want to detect Allah's presence beyond our sensory perceptions or beyond our human limitations. This month of Ramadan is meant to harvest this potential in us. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ The word la'alla means that we are doing what is required. Whether the results are going to appear the way we expect them to or not is another matter. So there is a hope there is an expectation, there is a yearning in achieving taqwa once we observe what is mandatory in this month of fasting. I think enough has been said about taqwa. 
There's an ayah in the Quran, 201, surah number 7. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفٌ مِّنَ الشَّيْطَانِ تَذَكَّرُوا فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ this taqwa that we are speaking about, and there are many ayat in the Qur'an that you want to concentrate on with your heart and with your mind. This is only one of them. It says, indeed, those who are actively conscious of Allah's power presence, therefore they are actually avoiding His corrective measures. Allah is just. If you go off course, it doesn't matter what your name is, what your rituals are. If you go off course, you are going to encounter the consequences. This ayah is saying, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا Indeed those who are guarding their lives and themselves in an active way, meaning every moment of their lives, they are conscious of Allah's corrective power presence. Inna ladina taqaw. Ida masahum ta ifum mina shaitan. If they are to be influenced by a transient presence of a shaitan. Ida masahum ta ifum mina shaitan. We're all human beings. Some of us may encounter some evil. Thoughts, but that's humanity out there. Some of us may have some inclinations in ourselves to do what is wrong and what is contrary to Allah, even in our feelings inside. We may not do it, and some of us may even do it. Whenever a shaitan has an influence, and remember this influence is transient, a shaitan does not have a fixed influence on a ladina taqaw. He has a bypassing influence. Ida masahum ta'ifu min a shaitan. So what happens? Once I have, let's say, a bad thought, or I am thinking about doing something wrong. Whether I do it or I don't do it, the result is tadhakkaru. We become conscious. Meaning a shaitan has his effect upon us when we are subconscious, when we are unconscious. That's when a shaitan begins to do his work. Conscious of who? Of Allah. And Allah as a power and a force. Not a theoretical Allah, not an abstract Allah, a here and now Allah. Jalla Jalalu. In the Ladina Takaw, either Massahum Ta ifum mina shaitani tadakaru. Which means the attempt of a shaitan upon Al Muttaki is going to result in an elevated consciousness. تَذَكَّرُوا فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ At that time, they gain insight. At that time, they can see the issues correctly, accurately. فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ This is the effect of taqwa. Not this foggy notion about piety. What is piety, I ask you? What is piety? What does it mean? Ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu, kutiba alaykum al-siyam, kama kutiba ala al-lazina min qablikum, la'allakum tattaqoon. The word al-siyam here also has to be fine-tuned. Al-siyam is usually explained as fasting. That general word fasting. As-siyam means beyond this English language trench. As-siyam means you withhold 
following a desire in you. You don't want to be subjected to your whims or your lusts. We have a desire to eat. We have a desire to drink. We have a desire to copulate. We have a desire to gain wealth. We have a desire to gain power. We have other desires. Asiyam is meant to stop that desire, not to kill it, to stop it. So when we abstain, when we don't eat or drink, when we don't satisfy the appetites in us, this is a siyam. And the rudimentary, the beginning of a siyam is to abstain from nutrition, from food and from water from the appetite of the stomach and the sexual appetite. That's the beginning of it. And then it works its way through the other appetites that men have, that mankind has. So this is a month, if we understand what we are doing, we understand why we are fasting it turns out to be a month of discipline you discipline yourself when you put your appetite under control you control your appetite it's not your appetite that is controlling you and you do this because you are aware of Allah's power presence all the other forms of devotion to Allah are seen. When we pray, when I pray or you pray, some other person sees you. When you go to the Hajj, you do it, you do it in a manifest way. You, you, when you pay the sadaqah and the zakah, that's observable. Other people can see. That. But when you fast, that's something no one can tell whether you are fasting or not except yourself. This is one of the obligations that is only between you and Allah. Tabaraka wa ta'ala. The other ones are a type of social obligation. You go to a salah in the masjid or elsewhere, here we are praying in the tens, in the hundreds, in the thousands. When we go to Hajj, here we are in the millions. When we pay our zakah, the poor person receives it, so he's knowing someone is giving him. But in this siyam, who knows? Only Allah. And it is this consciousness of Allah's knowledge that engenders in us this taqwa. Now, that being said, and many of the khutaba on this day, they stop here in this area. They don't want to take it a step further. And maybe that's why we've been praying in the street for over 31 years, because we are extending the meanings of this Qur'an into this life. One of the most important behaviors emanating from our perception of Allah's here and now power presence is al-amr bil ma'roof and an-nahi 'anil munkar al-amr bil ma'roof is to have what is self evidently good become the norm the social norm and that requires force it doesn't happen because someone writes an elaborate thesis or because someone gives 
a spellbinding speech. No. It becomes because it, it happens because there's a determination. And Nahi an al Munkar is the same way. What is self evident in its evil has to be deconstructed and disestablished. And that doesn't come by words. And it doesn't come by daydreaming. It comes by effort and it comes by sweat and it become and it, be, and it happens by tears and blood. Al-Amr bil ma'roof and al-Nahi an al-Munkar. We have a grand Munkar in Arabia. A humongous Munkar in Mecca and al Medina. As rulers, that's a Munkar. And because of the traditions, Ramadan is supposed to be a month of quote unquote piety and God fearing and devotion and these things and they tell you you can't speak about the Munkar who said who said is there any ayah is there any hadith that says in the month of Ramadan or any other month or any other time we can't speak about Al Munkar Everyone knows the answer to that. So we're going to continue to expose the munkar that has become an establishment in Arabia. And we will do it using the language of the rulers of Arabia who don't tire when they tell us that they are the custodians of the Sahaba. First and foremost among them is Omar. We say to them, your munkar comes out of your mouth and exposes you. And this month of Ramadan, we don't care about your worldly power. We care about Allah's power presence. You don't measure up to that. So we will speak the truth, even if it hurts you, even if it wounds you, even if it injures you, and even if it kills you. Let's take the Arabian Peninsula during the time of what they refer to as a salaf al-salih the first generation of muslims let's take look at arabia very quickly during that time arabia was something like no man's land there were few oases few sources of water we're talking about a whole peninsula here. And very quaint, very weak types of commercialism going on. The hub of it was Mecca. Besides that, every other place was virtually non-commercial. And this was the case during that generation, before that generation, until the time of Omar. When all of a sudden the Islamic domain stretched out and now there were the revenues of very fertile valleys around the Arabian Peninsula. The valleys in Iraq, the Euphrates and the Tigris. The valleys of the Levant with their water resources. The Nile Valley. This was land of agriculture. It was a land of skills. It was a land of what you may call the industry of the time. And all of a sudden, all of this revenue began coming in to the capital of the Islamic State. And this happened 
this type of uh, prosperity happened during the time of Omar. The time period in which this happened was shorter than the time period in which prosperity occurred in the Arabian Peninsula in our time. Right now, there's a lot of wealth in Arabia. In the time of Omar, a lot of wealth was beginning to accumulate in Arabia. This is what happened. When all of this wealth began to come in, we're not talking about a super rich administration or society or government. But compared to what it was, it became, it was just about to become affluent. So when much of this treasure came, and where did it come to? Was there a ministry of finances in Al Medina when Omar was ruling? No. All of this wealth came to the Masjid of the Prophet. And when Omar looked at this, he teared. Other people were looking at this with their appetites. The appetite for money. To make money. To gain wealth. To become prosperous. They, became, they began salivating at the opportunities that this wealth can generate. And Omar was in tears. Because he was afraid of the consequences of what this wealth will do to human nature and to these who, are, who have become Muslims and are becoming Muslims. Do these people today in Arabia, do they fit this description? Has anyone seen a tear? from any of the rulers in Arabia because of the riches that they've been seduced with? Anyone? Anyone saw a tear? One tear? None. So how do they claim that they belong to that generation and to those personalities? Where does this come from? Oh, granted, they have a lot of money. They have an, a media empire in the world. Okay fine. They can lie for years and for decades. Are we to believe them? They're, who are, they're tricking us? They want to fool us to think that they fit into that description? Omar ruled for 10 years, 8 months and 4 days. And how did he rule? Did he rule like these rulers in Arabia who represent the Munkar in our time? There was a period called the year of famine. Amur Ramada. This wasn't exactly one year, it's something like nine to ten months. But because it stretched so long, it's referred to as a full year. What happened during this year when Omar was ruling, unlike the rulers of Arabia today? Besides lifting the penalty for theft, you know, in Islamic jurisprudence, in Islamic law, a person who steals, and there are many details to this, is punished by losing his hand. And so during this particular time, and only in Arabia, where this terrible atmospheric and social condition combined when people they had to steal to live to survive 
When have you heard in the Arabian Peninsula where they apply this law? Where did you hear that this law cannot be applied to a person who steals because he wants his family to survive? Has anyone ever heard of this? No. Because they have no spirit in the laws that they say that they are responsible for. So, are they Omaris? They brag about Omar. They speak with platitudes about Omar, but do they meet his character? No, absolutely not. They are contrary to that character. In those harsh social and economic and agricultural conditions, there was a policy that was applied. And it could be sum it could be summarized in a few words. The policy that was applied by Omar, and we dare any of these Arabian rulers to even think of such a policy. The policy says Ida Ja Muslim Fala Malali Ahad. If one Muslim goes hungry, money doesn't belong to anyone. How many, how many, we're fasting, we're experiencing hunger and thirst, we're supposed to experience it. How many Muslims in this world are hungry? How many Muslims in this world are dying of hunger? as we are fasting. And then on the other hand, how many of these others, especially those in the Arabian Peninsula, who accumulate untold amounts of wealth, how many of them care for those who are dying of thirst and hunger and malnutrition and poverty, and they are in the hundreds of millions? When this famine hit the Arabian Peninsula, it was simply because there was no water, there was no rainfall, no precipitation for nine months. And water is very precious in desert life. Omar sent to his governors in Egypt, in Iraq, in Asham. He sent to them saying, Bring the surplus revenue that you have here to the Arabian Peninsula. Because people are starving. People are living conditions of famine. This is his words to the governor of Egypt at that time. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Min abdillahi Omar. ابن الخطاب أمير المؤمنين إلى العاصي ابن العاصي سلام عليك أما بعد أفتراني هالكا ومن قبلي وتعيش أنت ومن قبلك فيا غوثاه يا غوثاه يا غوثاه not an extended statement not a lot of words, but plenty of meanings. He says to him, in the name of Allah, the mercy giver, the most merciful, from Allah's subject, Umar, the son of Al-Khattab, the commander of the committed Muslims, to Al-Asi, the son of Al-Asi, peace, be yours heretofore do you see that we are perishing that I am perishing and those who are with me and you are living it up 
with those who are with you. فَيَا غَوْثَاهُ وَيَا غَوْثَاهُ وَيَا غَوْثَاهُ It's like saying S-O-S, S-O-S, S-O-S. Save our souls, save our souls, save our souls. And when finally relief came to al Medina, Umar, this will never happen in today's Arabian Peninsula. They can write many books and they can give many speeches and they can pay many mercenary writers. But it will never happen and don't be fooled by their media pens and their media mouthpieces. When this relief, the food and sustenance came to al Medina, Umar himself went out with those who were assisting him and began to distribute the, this nourishment, this food to those who were hungry. Have you ever seen any prince, any decision maker, any king in the Arabian Peninsula deliver with his own self, with his own time, what is needed to those who are in need and who are living at the survival level. And this is Ramadan when they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to have a behavior and a mannerism of taqwa. Do you detect it? Do you see it? During these months, look at the difference between rulers then in Arabia and rulers now in Arabia. During these months, Omar did not eat any butter, any fat, or any dairy products. He made with only oil until what some history books tell us the pigmentation of his skin changed because he wanted to live just like the people with him are living if these rulers in Arabia claim that they are the custodians of the Haramayn and they are looking out for the Muslims. Are they living the conditions, the circumstances of Muslims in today's world who are in need? Are they living like that? And if they're not, and they are not, then how can they claim that they are following Omar and that they are pro-Sahaba and that they are the maintainers of a Salaf al-Salih. How can this be? If they want to lie, they can lie to themselves, but not to the rest of us. One time, Omar saw one member of his extended family. During these harsh conditions, one member of his extended family eating a fruit. We weren't told what this fruit was. It could have been maybe grapes, maybe figs, maybe one of the fruits that was in the Arabian Peninsula was eating a fruit. And then Omar sees him and he says to him, Bakhin, Bakhin, Yabna Amir al Mu'minin, Ta'kulu al Fakiha wa Ummatu Muhammadin Hazla. Wow! Wow! You son of the commander of the committed Muslims, you mean to say, to show that you are eating fruits and the Ummah of Muhammad is emaciated, is thin and skinny. Meaning, how dare you do something like that? Compare that with the rulers of Arabia today. Their hunger 
and their thirst during this month are superficial and artificial because it doesn't generate an attitude and a behavior and a policy and a strategy to combat hunger and to defeat need. It doesn't generate it. Even their own wealth doesn't belong to them. They stuff themselves. It's become a mockery. Ramadan in Arabia is a mockery. The only reason they fast during the day, the way they fast, they sleep most of the day. And then after that, they wake up and they stay up most of the night eating. As if fasting was meant to charge their appetite. Fasting is meant to discipline the appetite not to charge it. In the Arabian Peninsula, they are fasting during the day so they can overeat during the night and to hell with those who are starving and dying of thirst and hunger and malnutrition. And they say that they are the custodians of Mecca and al Medina. They are liars. And this is their munkar. And we're not inflicted by a false religiosity saying, oh, this is Ramadan. You can't speak like that. It is because this is Ramadan, we have to speak like this to expose their munkar. There are some people who live during that time, Sahaba, who said, we were afraid if this year of famine did not come to an end that Omar was going to die because of his agitated feelings of not being able to feed the subjects that he is ruling. Do these rulers in Arabia care anything about the subjects that they are ruling? You can't even speak to them and say, when they do something wrong, you've done something wrong. They'll throw you in detention. And they're doing this periodically. And now the world, everyone around doesn't speak about that. Well, we can understand the forces of wealth and the military forces in the world, they want to defend one of their own. The Arabian rulers are one of their own. وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُمْ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِي الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ But how about us? We can't speak. We, we also have to toe the line. And we can't speak about this munkar in Arabia in this month of taqwa. And I will conclude by stating what Omar said concerning money and finances and wealth. He said, مَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ مِنَ النَّاسِ إِلَّا لَهُ فِي هَذَا الْمَالِ حَقٍ There is no one person from people except that he has a right to this wealth. To this treasury. وَمَا أَحَدٌ أَحَقُّ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٌ There is not one who is more rightful or more advantageous or more accessible to this wealth than anyone else. This is the justice and the equality that was burned into the conscience of the committed Muslims of that time. هُوَ مَالُهُمْ يَأْخُذُونَ It is their money and they partake of it. وَمَا أَنَا مِنْهُمْ إِلَّا كَأَحَدِهِمْ And I, Omar is speaking, and I am just like one of them. Does any king, any monarch, any ruler, any prince in Arabia dare say these words? And I'm just like one of you. They go on jumbo jets. They go with an entourage of hundreds of service individuals. 
They go shopping. Their shopping sprees, in their shopping sprees, they spend millions of dollars. This is not an exaggeration. And they, they want us to think that they fit in the mold of Omar. Who are they trying to deceive? Who are they trying to mislead? I feel happier to give them of what is theirs than they feel when they receive it. Look at all the wealth. Trillions of dollars out of Arabia. And they claim it for their families. And the rest of the Muslims can perish. They care not for the rest of the Muslims. This is a munkar. مَنْ رَأَى مِنْكُمْ مُنْكَرًا فَلْيُغَيِّرْ We have to change this munkar. فَالرَّجُلُ وَبَلَاؤُهُ وَالرَّجُلُ وَحَاجَتُهُ وَوَاللَّهِ لَوَدَدْتُ أَنِّي خَرَجْتُ مِنْ هَذَا الْمَالِ كَفَافًا لَا عَلَيَّ وَلَا لِي There are persons who are entitled. There are persons who are in need. And as far as I am concerned, my ultimate wish is to leave this world not owing any of this to anyone and not having anyone owe any of this to me. And the Prophet of Allah, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his, says, sabr." Observing the meanings of this siyam amounts to half of your patience. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ادعوه سبحانه وأنتم على يقين بالإجابة وتوبوا إلى الله إن الله تواب رحيم الحمد لله بجميع المحامد على جميع النعم وصلى الله وسلم على المبعوث خيرا ورحمة وهدى لكافة الأمم محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Dear committed Muslims, brothers and sisters Because of our withdrawal from our social responsibilities funny things happen take a couple of examples one of them in Egypt just the past few days the past week there in the city of Alexandria Iskandaria there are these signs that went up either on certain buildings or cars that said, هَلْ صَلَّيْتَ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ الْيَوْمِ Have you offered your salah to the Prophet today? And then all of a sudden, the government that now is the enemy of its own people began to think with a paranoid mindset. They're thinking, what is this? Some type of sectarian slogan inside of Egypt. In other words, they are trying to say that there are Shi'is here who are trying to turn the Sunnis into Shi'is. As-salatu ala nabi is something that a Sunni and a Shi'i equally offer in their salah. So a reminder such as that sentence, هَلْ صَلَّيْتَ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ الْيَوْمِ is just a reminder. Why should a government go into a spin of paranoia because of that? But that's, that's what happens when we can't even be our own selves. Today, this is the first Jumu'ah in the month of Ramadan in another area, in Al-Quds. Very few Muslims were allowed to enter Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Why? This is a masjid supposed to be, it's just like here, look. They prohibit Muslims for entering this masjid. We have a Zionist masjid in Washington, D.C. They're 
they're acting just like the Zionists. The Zionists do this when they feel threatened. The Saudi Zionists do this when they feel threatened. The Egyptian government is doing it when they feel threatened. Right now, they are trying to take over the masajid in which there are a'imma, khutaba, preachers, those who ascend the minbar, who want to speak their Islamic conscience about these life and death issues. And what happens? They want to kill us with their false religiosity. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan warzuqna tiba'a. Wa arina al-batila batilan warzuqna ijtinaba. Wa la taj'alhu multabisan alayna. Waj'alna lilmuttaqina imama. Rabbana, innana sami'na munadiyya. Yunadi lil iman. أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد ربنا صل على محمد وآل محمد ربنا صل على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم ربنا بارك على محمد وآل محمد ربنا بارك على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إن الله يأمركم أن تؤدوا الأمانات إلى أهلها وإذا حكمتم بين الناس أن تحكموا بالعدل إن الله نعم يعظكم به إن الله كان سميعا بصيرا ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة Allah, 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 Allah,